Welcome to Virtual Gold Podcast, a series of audio stories, interviews, play readings, and anything else that might take our fancy. Presented by Western Gold Theatre and featuring some of the best theatre artists in Canada. Western Gold Theatre is the premier company in the country, solely focused on sharing and celebrating the talents of senior professional theatre artists age 55 plus. The way we see it, theatre is not a job where you punch a clock daily and then collect a gold watch on your 65th birthday. Theatre people do not retire. Like good wine or a robust stew, we get better with age. We simmer, our flavor deepens. And one thing is for sure, older people love to tell stories. We believe creativity has no expiry date. Now, we invite you to sit back, grab a cup of tea, a glass of wine, or whatever you choose, tuck your feet up, listen, and enjoy. Today's episode brings you our first installment of Elio Day Online, interviews and candid conversations with the who's who of theater. In honor of International Women's Day, Ellie chats with actors and playwrights Jen Griffin and Marilyn Norrie, the forces behind My Mother's Story, the grassroots initiative that has taken off and is documenting women's history day by day in the voices of their daughters. International Women's Day is a global event celebrating the achievements of women since 1911. And if you are looking for wardrobe inspiration for this particular day, purple, green and white are the colors. Purple signifies justice and dignity. Green symbolizes hope. White represents purity, albeit a controversial concept. Now please welcome Elio Day. Hi, I'm Ellie O'Day, and with me today is Marilyn Norrie and Jen Griffin from My Mother's Story. <laughs> the first time I heard the term My Mother's Story, what came to my mind immediately was, oh, could I tell stories about my mother? But that's not exactly what you were getting at. You were getting at something different, Marilyn. How did it all start? Oh, how did it start? My goodness. Well, I it was 2004. I was bored with and frustrated with all of the ways that women were being portrayed in scripts I was auditioning for, uh, scripts that I was dramaturging when I, you know, film, plays, whatever. And I thought, oh, my God, there has to be something out there. Uh, other stories of how women have lived. I was at a wedding and um, a friend uh, was telling me this story and she said, oh, but to understand what I mean, you have to know my mother's story. And my mother was born at this, this year and this is her parents and then they did this and then they do that. And I heard it as a character arc, which is what we use in plays and screenplays, you know, the character starts here and goes there. And I thought, that is so cool. I wonder if I could do that. I wonder if I could tell the details of my mother's life in order like it was um, a script. And so I started telling her my mother's story and it felt like all of the thoughts were coming from different parts of my head because I had never put them together into one piece. And I got to the end and it wasn't nearly as exciting as, as her mother's story, which was like all over the world and World War II and all these things. But, you know, I thought, oh, it's okay. Well, she thought it was like one of the best stories she'd ever heard. She'd never heard anything like it. And I thought, well, we do not value the familiar. So I sent an email out to my friends. I thought, okay, let's uh, get a random sample here of uh, women actors in Vancouver. I sent them an email and I said, write your mother's story. Uh, this, these will be like snapshots of women in the 20th century. And duplicating that kind of uh, the scenario of what I had experienced at the wedding, I said, uh, your mother's life uh, from beginning to end, uh, just the facts, not your opinions or your you know, um, issues. And uh, you are just a footnote. Now, originally I had said a thousand words. Um, you know, a year later I changed it to 2000 words, but that's it. 
and that has stayed like that and that's the writing recipe that we use so the story that went out we got i don't know a dozens and like 60 100 people eventually had written their mother's story we said oh my god we have to do a show jen said i know how to do it i know how to put together a show we created nine different scripts of collaging all of these stories together and over the course of about 10 years we were doing these shows and that was about so that was about i don't know yeah but when was the last time that we did it 2012 we did it presentation house in north van they commissioned us to uh create a show and uh we published the book from those the stories that were written and uh, so we've published uh, two anthologies. We've got an online archive, a nonprofit society, you know, all that. Mm -hmm. Jen, what drew you to this? Um, ooh, uh, Marilyn's email, which was, um, you know, because I'm an actor in Vancouver, I was on the email chain that received this email. But um, before that, I had done a one person show called Drinking with Persephone, which was, um, kind of like my teenage diary. It started with my dad's death at the age of nine and my mother's death when I was 19. And my mom was a character in the show. Like it was a one person show, but you know, my mother was an active character in the show. And uh, after that, it was like, I had told my childhood impression of my mother, but my mother's life had never been documented. And in so many ways, I felt like she was an unsung hero um, also, um, you know, I mean, I, I had to grow up without her. So there was a longing and a need to bring her in back to me. And with writing, that's what, you know, if we can um, invoke the dead, we can bring them back to life. And so whenever I had a chance to work on her story or tell the story, uh, my mom was back with me, you know, and I needed her. <laughs> so um, I needed her at many times in my life, but it was a comfort. And also um, in my case, and everybody's different, you know, like in my case, I will, I will go to my grave feeling that I disappointed my parents. That's just my thing, you know, like I'm, that's my thing. And with other people, um, they, they were good kids and they just wanted to honor their parents. I was a bad kid and I had a lot of guilt and I still probably do, and a lot of shame. And um, it was a kind of an atonement, but with jokes, an atonement with jokes. <laughs> That's interesting that you discovered something about yourself writing about your mother's story. Oh, the disappointment part? Yeah. I think I knew that before, but I was trying to forget that it wasn't a reality, but um, what did I learn? I learned how funny my mother was as I had to revive her. Um, yeah, I, it was a way of cherishing something that I think was probably her greatest, well, one of her greatest gifts. Resilience and humor would probably be the two. Um, practicality, you know, the things that I feel in me that I can draw on that were my mother's gifts to me. So, and that's, and that's also the thing what we have discovered is that most people do have an issue with their mother, whether it's that, uh, whatever it is, and that seems to take up so much space in our consciousness. Now, I don't know when you, Ellie, were saying that you could tell lots of stories about your mom, if that you meant the stories of what she had done, or whether it was your perception of who she was. But when you write down the facts, <laughs> the what? It was certainly the latter. Yes. See that, and and those are our issues. When you just get yourself out of the way and write the facts from beginning to end, we we said that Jen came up with this term. We go from a big issue, small mother, to big mother, small issue. Yeah. Whatever your issue is, it just takes a very very small part of the final story probably like sometimes a sentence, sometimes it's not even included. Because she was a full person 
she wasn't living her life in order to give us issues. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's part of, um, it's cultural and, and um, it's part of our current ethos that we are therapizing around our parents. Like that was, that's, wasn't something that people were doing in the 19th century. Um, they were beginning to, you know, there was the beginning of, of that sort of analysis and psychotherapy and, and whatnot, but it's just full tilt in the 20th century. And then um, in the 21st as well, um, I wonder, I wonder if in 20 years people will write their mother's stories. Right now I feel, um, uh, they will still be writing their own stories. There's <laughs> something about about the um, about the parent just kind of being like a disposable vessel that can just be tossed aside. You know, it's I don't know. I I agree with you totally, and this is one of the things that we Jen and I have talked about. It's like why is it that people don't do this? Um, I. I, for all that I sent out this email and said, you know, everybody else write your stories. It took me a long time before I actually wrote mine, my mother's story down. And I was just like internally kicking and screaming about it because, because I had to put it all in order. And I'm, I, and I look at that feeling that I had and go and wonder about it. Like, what is that hesitance that I had? What is that resistance? that I had to writing things down and to then give it to my family. And they thought it was odd <laughs> um, that I would even think of doing that. My mother said, you know, I feel like a piece of folk art and, and or, or, you know, seeing my life through the wrong end of a telescope. Yeah. And, and, and it really is making a person's life into a piece of art in that way, an encapsulized life. Um, with just the high points, the plot points of a person's life. As we tell these stories in, in movies and plays, in novels, you get to write everything. And they do, and the, and the good writers make it look easy. But for the rest of us trying to write these things, it's much better. I found doing workshops since then, people understand movies. It's like, do we understand this character? No, we don't. Okay, well, what are you going to do about it? Whereas in play or, or books, it just, you know, you can just go on and on and on and on and, and things like that. It's much more um, to the point if you look at the dramatic writing. You can track the poetic gesture in a person's life. I believe it's possible. Um, it, it, one has to be willing. I mean, there were many stories submitted to Marilyn and there were many stories submitted for the shows. And, um, you know, people were coming at their mother's story from different places and, and everyone's different. Not everybody's, you know, like blah on Facebook, you know, I'm kind of blah, but cryptic on Facebook. Some people are, you know, fully exposed. Um, it's almost like an x-ray on Facebook and everybody's different. So we would get stories um, that were saccharine where mother was a saint and there was no, she didn't do anything wrong. And, and we didn't believe those stories at all. No, but that's where the daughter was coming from. Yeah. It was like the daughter needed to think of the mother as a saint in order to continue with her life. You know, like it was like, I need to think of my mother as a saint. If I think of her as anything other than a saint, I can't carry that burden or, um, people who thought the other, the opposite of their mother, or people who found their mothers boring. Like um, I asked one of my friends who's a writer to write their mother's story. And she was just like, maybe my grandmother's story, but my mother, you know, like, why? And that was so extraordinary because we never found a boring story, no. except when somebody wasn't telling the truth. I mean, every single, when we got those stories, it was like, oh my God. Like I thought they were all gonna be kind of the same. No, no. Every life is absolutely unique. And they were abs they were like these these stories that were just happening in very precise places in the world where there were, you know, events going on around them. Yeah. And we could see 
how this one woman negotiated her life through it. That's why we decided, okay, forget a book. We want to put these on stage. It was the best theater we'd ever seen. Well, also, we just to clarify, I mean, when Marilyn did, um, when did it come to me most profoundly? I think everyone was reading their stories and it was in Joy Coghills. Oh, yeah. Uh, she lived there uh, in that condo down, down on uh, the Fraser, on the Fraser, Fraser River. River. That right. was right when we were getting a book together. Right. So I went to that and I was new to the game and I listened to stories being shared. And um, maybe, you know, cheekily on my part, I was there and in, in the experience thinking, well, this is cool, but you know, these people aren't writers particularly, but they're all great actors. So why don't we do a show? Like, it's like, because writers, people that are steeped in, in writing prose, the way that they would tell their mother's story was different than the way a bunch of actors would tell their mother's story. Mm -hmm. They were going, actors would sometimes go from dramatic event to dramatic event to a fault. Like it would be like, we don't need to know about the hysterectomy. Let's just, you know, like, <laughs> that's not really telling us anything. It's just making your mother's hysterectomy known to the public, right? Like it was like, so let's, and, and does that matter? Um, because, you know, was there a story around that or it was just like, something that happened over breakfast and that could be funny it was like so glad i had a hysterectomy but that wasn't <laughs> how <laughs> how it went down i didn't come out that way somebody no. had a uterus that was falling out at an airport it was a prolapsed uterus that's what it was and it was like anyway no, that had to let's, go let's it not like, do that i know you find that really dramatic and it is really dramatic and it would be a horrible and weird scene in a movie but is this in a dignified way telling telling your mother's story is it sublime or is it just you know kind of sensationalist yeah, sensationalist. trying to get the you know the did, did the you rag any non-artists submit their stories because you're talking about a lot of actors or writers that submitted that's how it started yeah outside that circle did you get any non oh yeah when we did the north vancouver show i i did workshops at the libraries across north vancouver and it was just whoever saw the sign in the elevator that would come in there. And we had, I just had a great number of people who were quite fascinated about this idea that something about their lives might be interesting. Yeah. And, and really just taking the challenge because the thing is 2000 words, right? Is about three and a half pages, depending on your font and stuff like that. You can write it in two hours. You will have the whole story written in two hours. You just sit there and you just put down the facts. What happened next? What happened next? What happened next? You know, the anecdotes that you remember, you put them all down there and then it's done. But we have such resistance. We have such hesitancy. I try to get people to, to write in the same way they, they would tell the story. And this is, and Jen's absolutely right. The real, the real, the writers, the practiced writers would, would, no, you know, maybe they wouldn't use cliched phrases. Yeah. But other people would say, would use their cliched phrases, but you could always hear their voice in that way. It was the authentic voice that was that was coming through. And they'd say, okay, the the writer was not was a was a footnote, was just a, a very um a small character most of the time in that story. But you always knew who the writer was because their voice was so clear. And that was a really liberation, I think, for a lot of people was that that if they had something to say, if they trusted the material that they had, someone else would say, you know what, that is really interesting. And I've had a, started, I've had a few started, people that weren't interesting, but that it's it's an anomaly. People through this process um, gave themselves permission to become writers in some cases like yeah there was one woman who was already a poet but now her she's much more prolific since my mother's story um another woman this was her first brush with with writing and then she learned to write for herself all the time and does the flame and you know like mm -hmm. they so many things came together where the this person knew they could write for themselves um, 
through writing about their mother. I think uh, of it. I think of it as being a cork in a in a cat. You know, is yeah. that there's a lot of people who have got intense writer's block. Yeah. You take that cork out. You take you tell the story of your mother's life which you know has got all the secrets and you know and the emotional containment of that you take that that removes the the cork and you can write about anything then yeah so there was there was all the sort of natural impulses to um to write our mother's story and whether or not it you know there were some kinds of um undealt with neuroses like needing for attention or whatever it was that drew people to you know well, let's go and hang out with Marilyn at that at Joy Coghill's basement and write our mother's story and maybe Marilyn's got a gig that she can give me you know whatever was going on so many other things came of it um yeah. that that had validity and for me the most important thing and it's what I I think I approached Marilyn with uh, because I knew how to collage things and I'd learned that uh, in poetry. Um, and that was that we were telling untold women's history and it was a truly feminist act. The whole piece was um, a voyage through feminist, a voyage of feminist integrity um, because these were untold stories. These were not, um, and they were not stories of um, of women who had been happily married their whole lives and you know did everything the husband said and it's like or that's... cured cancer or did like extraordinary things or you know and deserved notoriety yeah they there were... were husbands but somehow um the the woman in telling the story the woman received the emancipation that she maybe didn't have in her life like when i think about telling my own mother's story um she was very unheralded she did a lot of heroic things and maybe in her own way she wanted to be a savior but she definitely did a lot of heroic things and and I'm like I know that and I know how awesome she was um particularly on a societal level and and how hilarious she was with me and uh, the bizarre nature of our you know connection um it, she was a great character that was worth sharing with the world and there was one thing that we did at the end, and that is um, <laughs> the what did your mother always tell you? And it was the most hilarious part of the show, um, always, because there was some, you know, kind of Irma Bombeck, you know, Reader's Digest <laughs> kind of phrase that the mother had told the daughter, you know, like along the lines of always wear clean underwear in case, you know, you, you get killed in an accident. And Hit by a bus. Off hit by a bus, yeah, um, always look under things, you know, the things our mothers told, uh, told us, you know, uh, these little adages it, that peppered our life and always wear lipstick or whatever, you know. And, and, and sharing them in a group was fabulous. Because yeah. everybody went, yeah. Well, and laugh. Yes, the two of you, by the way, point out two things about this process that are really interesting in that when I first came across my mother's story, I thought, well, my mother's gone. How can I write her story? I don't, I don't know so many of the facts, but each of you have shown that you can still write that story, oh, yeah. whether your mother's still with you or not. And you have a lot of, by the way, we should point out, you have a fabulous website and there's all kinds of video clips of people telling little excerpts of their stories there. So you get a real sense of the range of circumstances out of which people wrote their story yeah. because that, that jumped right out to me is why they wrote their story. And some people wrote the story because that saying that they didn't know anything mm -hmm. and, that, and that is a good story. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, and, and as I tell the, the writers, I say sometimes asking the question yeah. is more interesting than having the answer. Mm -hmm. Why don't I know this? Why don't I, and like every mother is a mystery. You just, and, and that is a revelation to an awful lot of people who feel guilty because they don't know more, who feel like they know everything. Their mother was larger than life and they have to put her into a smaller container so that they can, that's your life and this is mine, okay? There. 
I've written your whole life in it, then there it is. It's, it's, it's a very, very personal experience. Even if you didn't know your mo mother, we had, we've had a number of people who have written the story of their adopted mother and their birth mother. Mm -hmm. And it's still just the facts of a woman and what she did and where she came from and what happened next. Right. But that those stories that our mothers told us about when she was growing up or the circumstances, I mean, like as a little kid, that's your first roadmap. Yeah, that's the map that goes into your brain. That is the grid work upon uh, upon which all the other stories you ever hear are going to go in relationship to those stories your mom told you. And you will believe that what she told you is the way that it is for everybody until you learn that it isn't but yeah. there's some kind of baseline thing that you know so for anybody to investigate that and say okay well what's the baseline that i that i lived with that i that i grew up with what are you know and again as, as jen was saying you know in therapy and and recovery and also spiritual um followings that people do they ask those questions most people they don't they they're they're looking at what they have to do next and their mother is somebody that they cart out for mother's day or her birthday or maybe you have a little cry and then you put the box away again and uh you don't really examine the great stories that you you grew up on yeah also the history you know like how the culture has shifted and our mothers lived at different times and um, and the culture shifted in our lifetimes. Like um, my mother did not have um, a liberated life. Like she was not fully emancipated. She, she didn't know how to drive a car. She didn't know how to ride a bike. She didn't know how to swim. She didn't ever have like a career, but she was a huge um, presence in the community. And there was a lot of frustration. She wasn't fully educated. She hadn't been, uh, she didn't grow up at a time where um, it was customary for women to seek higher education, for women to be um, self-sufficient. Um, but the drive within her to be educated and self-sufficient was there. So there was, there was tension, you know, within my mother around that. And um, and sorrow um, because, you know, um, women, there's this idea that women were perfectly happy when they had no power. No, no, <laughs> no. It's like, <laughs> like, well, we see movies where, you know, we still celebrate, you know, the Jane Austen. It's like, oh, they were so happy. And it's like, they were freaking powerless and it sucked. And if they wanted to go into town, they had to wait for somebody to like, take them and they and they oh, were kicked out of their they were kicked out of their father's house because their their brother it localized everyone it made us focus on our tiny unimportant lives um which i've sometimes called our um tender shitty little lives but <laughs> it makes us focus on on our dear little selves and our tiny little worlds and appreciate um, how we are microcosmically affected by everything that happened around us. Like, where were you when JFK, blah, blah, blah. You know, but the big events happen, but it's our tiny lives that give us the texture of who we are and what we have and our understanding of the universe, right? So- I And think I think that, that it has been, it has been one of the things though of writing this is that there are so many people who are so immersed in their own tiny life that they cannot understand or or write down someone else's even their mothers even their mother who was standing right beside them the whole time <laughs> also you know, like like that myop myopia is like a, a amazing how you go okay so it's not about you and that's just like a revelation to so many people. also it's a bit of an antidote to therapy don't you say like i mean the the wrong side of therapy in the sense yeah. that when sometimes in therapy or 12-step programs and blah 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 whatever even talking with friends we can reduce our mothers to it's like a fault finding mission i'm like this because my mother did all these things right yeah. instead of 
um, being on and and or the saccharine, which is kind of like spiritual bypass. No, she was perfect. That's why I'm crazy. But <laughs> but that that other thing too, as opposed to just like really looking at her as best you can um, through your your memory with with the rules of facts. You know, it's like okay, anecdotes, sure, jokes, sure, but what are the facts? Um, and it's a I don't know, it's a great celebration. Like for me, the coolest thing was um, when we told Janice George, George's story in North Vancouver. I wonder, uh, Jen mentioned earlier that there is a next generation coming along. So have you had any experience of younger women coming to tell their mother's stories? Yes, yes, we have. And, and in fact, we're you know getting people, getting kids to tell their mother's stories. Um, with kids, you know, keeping it to when mother hit 20 or something like that. So you don't get into current things going down. But the relationship between um, a child and their mother, whether it's a boy or a girl, is the same no matter when it is in history. They, they still have all of the need to not pay attention because it is not natural for a person to go away from their mother to go away from their father and to dismiss that as they build their own lives. So to turn around again and look back and say, okay, well, what was that is, is a new and very exciting thing. Now, okay, I just wanted to say though, the young people today really don't know what it was that we lived in through and they really don't know what it is that our mothers lived through. That idea of normal has changed so much and it has changed so much since 2016. With right, yeah. There's, um, yeah, it's a bit inflated, like, like hyperbolic. Um, but I think that, yeah, I noticed that with, with some of the young people I was connecting with around that, um, that we were people who lived through extreme sexual harassment. We did, I mean, it was like, oh, hi, it's Monday, grope, grope. You know, like it was just, part of life. And so it was a bit shocking when um, teens and 20 somethings were telling me everything that I didn't understand about sexual harassment. Like I was like, <laughs> that's when I became like my mother in my, you know, like it was like, yeah. Oh my God, like, where do I begin? You know, it, it. And, yeah. the, and, and also the images of women on stage or on screen has changed profoundly. Yeah. Women actually get to talk about things other than a man. Uh, they get to have conversation. They get to make decisions. They get to lead the forces. It's hard to it's hard to explain. Like it was hard for me to understand as a teenager why my mother didn't know how to swim or ride a bike or drive a car or any of those things. And why didn't you fight harder? But as I've lived through these times of oppression, you know, my my kinds of oppression in my life, um, I know that the culture didn't support my freedom, did not support my emancipation at different times. And now I can, I hold it in my heart. You know, I hold my mom closer in my heart because of her, her inability to break through and be fully free in her life. Um, so I understand those words, the culture did not support it. And now since 2016, and then with, um, the Me Too movement, and then now um, after the murder of George Floyd, we're in a new understanding of of the marginalized and and BIPOC populations, and how that's yet another layer of extreme oppression that that we need to uh, you know. It's amplify. giving voice to it, giving voice to that as well. That's and giving voice that. to all of these things. It's amazing. And to understand, Jen, I would like to thank you very much because this really shows us why we have to record our mother's stories. So the different generations also can share and understand their perspective that they've had throughout their lives. Yep, I think yep. so. Yeah, thanks Sally. Thank you. And this is a special for International Women's Day. Thank you very much from Western Gold Theater. We have Marilyn Nori and Jen Griffin and my mother's story. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks Sally. Bye. Bye bye. We hope you enjoyed this first installment of Elio Day Online featuring Jen Griffin and Marilyn Norrie. 
marked annually on March 8th, International Women's Day is witnessed worldwide as we come together to celebrate women's achievements and rally for women's equality. Please applaud every woman you know and consider supporting a women's charity of your choice. Editing and sound for Elio Day Online provided by Stephen Bullitt. Creative inspiration and content provided by our guests, Jen Griffin and Marilyn Nori. This podcast has been presented to you by Western Gold Theatre. Visit our website at www.westerngoldtheatre.org to find out about upcoming podcasts and other virtual gold programs, such as online presentations and creative workshops. Located in Vancouver, BC, we thank the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations for sharing their beautiful lands with us. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider donating by visiting our website at www.westerngoldtheatre.org. Every bit helps and counts. Thanks to our many supporters and donors, the Canada Council for the Arts, BC Arts Council, BC Government Community Gaming, City of Vancouver, the Vancouver Foundation, the Hamber Foundation, the McGrain Pearson Endowment Fund, McElwain Stewart Family Fund, McLean Foundation, and the many individuals who so generously support our programming. Stay well and safe, physically distant, and socially close. And remember, creativity has no expiry date.